here's the rest of the chapter, precipitation reactions. So if you have something like this, what's the name of that stuff? It's a solution. It's a solution. It's liquid. It tells you it's dissolved. Or we remember that all group 1 metal cations are soluble in water. And barium chloride, this one's telling you that this is dissolved. And then you put them together and you end up with this and a precipitate. Well, all we really care about is the NIE, the, uh, the net ionic equation. But this is the whole molecular equation. So if you're still new at this, go ahead and write that all out. But what's really happening is the sodium chromate is dissolving into two sodium ions and one chromate ion. Barium chloride does the same. And then all of them are in the beaker. They're all moving around because of, I erased it already, because of the lattice energy. The ones with the higher charge kind of find each other. They love, join up make a precipitate fall to the bottom of the beaker. That's why it's called a precipitate. It comes down. But the sodium ions and the chloride ions are the same on both sides. So you have to swipe all that out and just put the net ionic equation. That's all we want, the NIE, in every case. No spectators. OK, ready? Predict. What are you going to get? What's going to precipitate? CGCR. Yeah, the, the potassium and the nitrate will always be soluble. So the only thing that could precipitate is the silver chromate. And this is a minus 2 ion. You can tell that here. So chances are the lattice energy is high enough to pull them together. How about this guy? Silver chloride. This is the lab we do in Excel where we first pull the silver out of silver nitrate using copper, a single replacement reaction. And then we do this double replacement reaction. And you make that kind of white, gray stuff, silver chloride. How about this one? BASO4. What's the name of this stuff? Nickel 2 chloride. The only thing it could make is nickel 2 hydroxide. This one? Nothing. Yeah, they're all soluble. What's the name of this guy? Copper 2 sulfate. So you could make copper 2 hydroxide. Lead, lead two hydroxide. So you don't want to include these spectators. You you would cross those out. Uh, lead two hydroxide. I, yeah, lead two hydroxide. Uh, we're not going to spend any time balancing. So again, net ionic reactions only. So this is the whole thing. If you still want to do that, that's fine. Just be sure and circle this one. So I know you know that we only need the NIE. These are all really easy. OK, this is a real typical problem. What mass of solium, solid sodium chloride do you need to add to 1.5 liters of 0.1 molar? So when you see volume and molarity, you should think, what? Oh, molarity. Well, times volume is moles. moles. Yeah, so when you see volume and molarity, you should think, I can get moles out of this. That was that lower right branch of our molar highway. So we want to know how much sodium chloride to precipitate all of this. This is a solution. It's dissolved. So it's like a mixture of stuff. There's silver ions and nitrate ions. And you want to stick something in, like a probe, that'll go in and grab all the silver, only the silver. And it, you can precipitate it out as silver chloride. And then you can just filter it out, and decant off the other stuff that's in there, the sodium and the nitrate ions. So the first thing is get moles of what's given. This is the however, this is 0.15 uh, moles of silver nitrate because it's one to one stoic of silver to nitrate. That's how many moles of silver ions you have in the beaker. And then make the reaction. Oh, sorry, we don't care about that. That's what we care about. This is going to be the, the reaction that makes this solid. We know the, the amount of that, 0.15 moles. The question is, how much of that? Well, since it's one to one stoic, you need one point. Whoops. Sorry, that's the wrong order. 0.15 moles of that. And because this is the limiting reactant, this stuff is cheap. Sodium chloride, that's going to be in excess. Because this is the limiting reactant, it's going to determine how much product you make. They're going to be the same. So this is like the easiest kind of precipitation problem you could have. I give you something that's one to one stoic for both of them. I give you the molarity. I give you the volume. You've got the moles of the limiting reactant. And the rest is pretty easy. We just have to turn this into a how many, what mass of uh, sodium chloride do we throw in? So we add that. We probably would add like 9 or 10 because it's so cheap. You want to make sure you get out every single ion of silver. Um, this is also more typical. This one's a little bit more difficult because, look, you've got 2 to 1 and 2 to 1 here. And also, this one just said 
what mass of, of the silver chloride gets precipitated, this one says how much is remaining in solution of all the other ions. So this is like the hardest type of problem we would have for this chapter. So what you have is a, a beaker full of water. The water is the same on both sides of the equation, so we don't include it. We've got two little bottles. They're both liquids, and it tells us that because it says uh, volume times molarity. Yeah, the other one said solutions. So one is lead to nitrate, and the other was sodium sulfate. And you're putting some of this and some of this. So what kind of a problem is it? Double, it is a double replacement, but what kind of a stoic problem is this? Two amounts are given. Yeah, you got to find out which one is limiting. And also, the other problem is that it's going to ask us what's in the solution after the precipitate forms. So we've got sodium ions in a 2 to 1 ratio to sulfate. I didn't put the ions. I'm going to run out of room in my beaker. And we've got lead 2 ions and 2 nitrates in there as well. And these guys find each other and boom, make a precipitate. So this stuff on the bottom is the lead 2 sulfate. Now the question is, what's left? Sodium and nitrate ions. The sodium and the nitrate moles didn't change. When you dump them in, if you dumped in 10 moles of that, you're still going to get 10 times 2 of sodium ion. But what's changed is, is the concentration. And the other problem is one of these, you, you're never going to have exactly the stoichiometric amount to use all of them up. One of them is going to be in excess, so whatever's cheaper. So we would probably end up with extra sulfate ions in here. So you might end up having excess sulfate, of, you know, that extra of the excess in the solution. So this is our actual precipitation reaction, lead, lead to ion and sulfate ion. And then remember I told you about the IRE chart? This is another example of where this really comes in handy. We found out uh, this times this is our lead to ion, and this times this is our sulfate ion. Well, you, it's one to one stoic, so you can see which one's limiting. So that's going to determine how much you make. And you can also easily see how much of the excess you have. You can just subtract 0.05 from that. So this is a really nice technique. I took the moles of uh, PBSO4 that we're going to make times the molar mass. That's how many grams of uh, lead to sulfate. That's the first question. This is the other part, though. And yeah, you should probably take the time to write this down if this were the, the kind of question on the exam. On my exam, yeah, we'll probably have one like this. Here's the easy one. The limiting reactant, it got used up, so it's zero. Remember, square brackets means concentration in moles per liter. The sodium and the, and the nitrate ion, as we said, it's what you started with. That's still in the beaker, that number of moles, because they don't participate in the precipitate. But don't forget, it's times two. So it's the volume times the molarity of the sodium sulfate times two, because when this dissociates, you get two ions of sodium. And then what everybody also forgets is the new volume. They just go ahead and go 200 liters. No, you've mixed it together. You have a new additive volume. So don't forget that. It's the same on all of these. Nitrate's the same. We've got, it's a twofer here. So it's the volume times the molarity times two. That's the nitrate ion moles over the new volume. And then this one is probably the hardest problem of this. It's just what you have in excess minus the limiting reactant, and it's one to one, so it's really easy to do over that new volume. And then check sig figs, three and three and three and three and three, we're all good. So that's like your basic solution stoichiometry question. It wouldn't be the hardest because it's one to one stoic. I got that one here, right? Uh, no. What volume of 1.1 molar sodium hydroxide would be needed to precipitate all the lead? Oh, yeah, here we go. That's a 2 to 1. So now we've got a 1 to 2 ratio, so it's a little bit more difficult. <clears throat> How much lead 2 ion do we have? Uh, we've got 20 mils. Oh, here's another problem. This is in milliliters, and molarity is moles per liter, so don't forget to turn that into liters. So if we multiply 20 mils, written as liters, times the molarity, that right here is moles of lead 2 ion. And then the ratio of, mol of lead 2 ion to hydroxide is 1 to 2. And then the molarity of the hydroxide is 0.1 moles per liter. 
So if you cancel units, you see all in one easy step where you don't have to write extra things down, you get the answer. And finally, you check your sig figs. Ah, so how many milliliters is that? 2 times 10 to the 2 is, is 200. But if you write 200 down, that's only one sig fig. And it was 2. 3 here and 2 there. So to write it with 2 sig figs, don't forget to put it in scientific notation. Yeah, ready? Well, we're... Well, we have, this is a one-to-one -one stoic problem. But these are one-to-one. -one. So like I said, we have three chapters coming on acids and bases. Woo! Woo! <laughs> yeah, woo! <laughs> Not until March. Yay. All of our acids, though, are going to be this neutralization react reactions. Even if it's a weak acid, it's still just one proton and one hydroxide makes water. This equilibrium lies so far to the right that you never have this and this in water unless there's an excess. So this always just right away forms water. And that's for strong acids and strong bases. Well, there's six strong acids, which we haven't talked about yet. HCl is one of them, nitric, perchloric, so HClO4. You got four big old hydrogens, super electronegative, pulling the protons, electrons away. Um, and sulfuric and uh, hydrobromic and hydroiodic. Did I call it? Yeah, I got them all. And then the rest are all weak, but you're not expected to memorize all the weak. If you know which ones are strong, then everything else is weak. Um, all the bases that are strong end in OH. So uh, essentially all this means is they break apart 100% water. That's their, what their strength is, is they come apart 100%. So if that's the case, then you've got free protons floating around and free hydroxide ions floating around. They join up immediately and form water. But sulfate and potassium do not join up and form a precipitate because all group one metal cations are always soluble in water. Same with chloride, sodium, and chloride ions. So they're all called neutralization reactions. This one even tells you what it is. So here's which acid? Nitric is one of the strong. Nitrous is not, just nitric. It's mixed with KOA, strong base. What are the concentration of ions left after the reaction? Well, it's just, it's like a um, limiting reactant problem. You've got that many moles of protons and that many moles of hydroxide ions. Whichever number is bigger, oh, don't make the mistake. Well, that's a minus sign. Sorry, it's getting a little purple. <laughs> Whichever number is bigger is the one that's in excess. So is this going to be an acidic or basic solution? See how easy it is to make the mistakes? So what's left? This much hydroxide, so it's going to be basic. So the pH is going to be more or less than 7. More. Uh, and now we're to redox. Everybody okay on this? Like I said, we got a whole chapter coming. That's really all it is. Oh, by the way, uh, I thought I had one with a diprotic acid, H2SO4. It still is 1H plus plus 1OH. You just pull them off one at a time until you get all the first ones off. Then you start working on the second ones. Like in a titration reaction, you'll get both of them off. It's just going to take you a while to get there. Okay, redox is um, a type of reaction. Remember I gave you these, and I, I kind of lied. I said there's five types of reactions. Well, there's really only two. There's this one and this one. So these are all this. What did I say about double replacement? Why were they not redox, remember? Something doesn't change. The charge doesn't change. So sometimes the charge is the same as the oxidation number, but they're not the same thing. It's, first of all, redox is spontaneous. That means you don't have to put energy into it, and it just happens by itself. It's like that activity series. Remember I said it's like a downhill reaction? It's spontaneous. It involves both an oxidation and a reduction. These are based on old words. It's like a legacy term, and fortunately, um, there's, you, you're just going to have to accept something about this. So when there's smart kids in the room, which all of you are, I tend to get questions like, well, why is it called, or how did that work? It's like, this is an old technique just to be able to balance equations and find out where the electrons go so you can figure out how electrochemistry works. That's what this whole thing is for. Um, it's not really understood how covalent bonding works for sure. They've got a lot of models. This is one such model, talking about oxidation numbers. What we do know is that since it's a model, we can use it to predict. It's a really good model. And if you follow, I put a little half sheet on your desk. If you follow this sheet, whoops, right here, redox tips, 
This will always work, and you'll get so fast at it that you won't spend more than 20 minutes trying to balance an equation and not get the 10 points on that one question because you couldn't balance the equation. So first of all, um, sometimes you're asked to assign the oxidation number. Again, it's kind of a made-up thing. It doesn't really mean that they've ever found a carbon with an oxidation of 4, a positive 4 or negative 4. It, they, they haven't. It's just a way of balancing these equations. Just accept that, and you're fine. So anything by itself, any atom in its elemental form at room temperature, which are all the homonuclear diatomics, horses need oats for clear brown eyes, anything by itself, a metal atom, silver, gold, any, any metal, Anything by itself that's a metalloid, like boron, if you look up here on the periodic chart, boron and silicon are metalloids. So you would just see B by itself or C by itself. That's like the soot when you burn a candle. That's just carbon. Or P by itself or S by itself. Any one of those, the oxidation is zero. If it's a monatomic ion, it's just the charge. And this is where everybody goes, oh, it's the same as the charge. Sometimes they equal each other, but it's not the same as the charge. So any ion, fluoride, chloride, bromide, iodide, or all the metals with their, their positive charge, the, that is their oxidation. Fluoride, you can always count on being negative one. Oxygen, you can almost always count on being negative two, except in peroxides. And sorry, there's a, an exception. So in peroxide, when you assign the oxidation to something like MgO, you can always go, Oh, this is minus two, and that's group two, so oops, it's positive two. Now that's oxidation, not charge. This case, though, is the exception. It's a per this is hydrogen peroxide. Its oxidation is minus one. There's two of them, so this oxidation, this negative oxidation number, is minus two. That means each one of these has to be plus one for that to be positive two. And that's the next one. Hydrogen is almost always positive one. You can almost always count on it being positive one, except for hyd hydrides. The group one metals will always be positive one. This hydrogen is so small, it can kind of go either way. You can force a proton or an electron on it, or you can strip the electron off. Either way, like I said, you just have to accept that it's this weird thing that works for this. And then the sum of all the ox numbers has to equal zero if it's a neutral compound. And if it's a polyatomic, it has to equal the charge. So let me show you an example of that. How do you write permanganate ion? MnO4, it's almost always with potassium, real common cheap oxidizing agent. Group one, this is always positive one. Oxygen is almost always negative two. There's four of them, so that's minus eight. So what's manganese going to be? plus seven. That's not the charge. It's the oxidation. Here, it's exactly the same. Minus two, minus eight. It's in order for the whole thing to be a negative one, this has to be a positive seven. So it's the same thing. As long as you add up to zero for neutral compounds and the charge for polyatomics. Question, or are you stretching? Okay, uh, here's what happens when you dip a piece of copper metal into silver nitrate. We did this lab in AP, uh, in Excel. This is a solid piece of metal, and this is the dissolved silver nitrate ions. This is a spontaneous reaction, a single thing and a double thing. They swap out. You get silver metal all over the copper. And the copper metal, you can see the wire sort of, it looks like it's dissolving. It's not. It's reacting. It's going away. So what's really happening is this. That's the NIE. What's happening to the copper if we break down the half reactions? Copper is going from zero oxidation and no charge, it's an atom, to plus two. So that means it had to lose two electrons to become more positive. Silver went from silver ion, which is plus one, and it became more positive. I'm sorry, whoops, it became more negative. So it's just like a number line. So we have to gain an electron. So this guy lost two and this one gained one. But you cannot have a metal spewing electrons out into solution and just having them go nowhere. They've got to go somewhere. So you've got to balance this guy. Well, that one was easy to balance. They're not always that easy. So we have Zumdahl's handy-dandy way of balancing equations. So these are called half reactions. This is the loss, L-E-O, loss of electrons, and the gain of, re of electrons is reduction. Those are the half reactions. Together, they're called redox. Um, the loss. L-E-O, and yes, this is where he growls, but you can't hear him. You can hear him on my laptop. 
or if you prefer, you're like more of a petrochemical kind of gal, oil rig. All right, so the loss is oxidation, the gain is the reduction. Yeah, what does that mean? Where did those words come from? Well, like I said, it's kind of a legacy thing. Here's sodium metal, really toxic. Chlorine gas, really toxic. <coughs> sodium chloride, table salt. Um, sodium went from metal to sodium ion. It lost one electron, so that's our oxidation. The chlorine gas, anything by itself, is the oxidation of zero. So it goes from zero to two chlorides. That's a negative two on that side, so we need two electrons. That's the reduction. This is where the word came from, an increase in oxidation state from zero to plus one, and then a decrease, so it's a reduction. It's an old legacy thing. Okay, so for the seniors in the room who might go on to study chemistry or physics or anything where you're going to need to do this, your professors will probably say reducing agent. This got really confusing for a lot of AP kids because it's what gets oxidized. So doesn't that seem like it should be the oxidizing agent? No, it's the agent of reducing. That means if I'm going to go out and make something gain an electron, I've got to give it an electron, so I get oxidized. But that got also confusing. They said, let's just remove these two words from the AP, so they're gone. But if you're a senior, or even a junior, this is still what everybody says, oxidizing agent, KMNO4. Uh, this is what they'll say. What got oxidized here? Well, you just check what lost electrons. Sodium. Chlorine gas is the one that got reduced. Chris, you had a question. Uh -huh. So is uh, sodium up there just an example of a monatomic ion? Uh, this is the monatomic ion. Yeah, yeah. This is yeah, the thing by itself in its elemental form. So it's zero and positive one for the oxidation, and which happens to be the charge, right? But they're not the same. <laughs> OK, uh, some of you might have come from another school or balance these another way. i got to tell you, these are never fail. and. The, the tips are on the back of this little half sheet, this little half sheet's on drive. I strongly urge you to adopt this method. Um, after other people learn the, the other book's way, they come to this and go, oh my god, this is so much easier, albeit weird. It's weird. Okay, so let's just say you got this. It doesn't fit into the, it's a double thing and a single thing, a double thing and a double thing. In fact, it's like, wait a minute, there's something charged and there's no other thing with it. Well, that was a spectator. And what the heck is this stuff? Per arsenic. What is this? What is it though? We know it's one thing. Acid. We know this is acidic. And all you do is write the half reactions of the thing, one of the things you start with, and what it turns into. Don't try to go, one book will say, write AS by itself here and find its oxidation. Don't monkey around with that unless it specifically says what's the oxidation of arsenic in this compound. Okay, don't monkey around with that. Just go to this method. So this has to become this. There's no way this is going to become that, right? So start with that and that, the two half reactions. And then you have to follow it in this order because the end result is to find what happens to the electrons, which is the whole point of this exercise. So just balance anything that's not hydrogen and oxygen. Well, we've got two arsenics here and only one here, so we need a two there. This one's nitrogen and nitrogen. We're done. Next, balance oxygen by adding hydro uh, water. It has to be in this order. Well, we've got three here and eight there. So we can only add water over here. We need five over here. Here we've got three and one, so we need two over there. Then you balance hydrogen by adding protons if it's acidic. How do we know it's acidic? Because there's an acid. Or it just says it was an acid. It'll tell you. So we've got 10 here and 6 here, so we need 4 protons over there. Look what we just did. We changed the charge, which is what we're trying to do here, is figure out the charge to find the electrons. And here, I had it as minus 1 here, because look, you can just lose that negative sign really easily. So when you're writing the equations, you've got to make sure you're not talking about nitrogen trioxide, but the nitrate ion. So be on the lookout for that. I've tried to replace my test 1 minus, because the minus sign just disappears sometimes. So we've got a negative one here, and it's neutral over here. Oh, sorry, we were doing protons. We've got uh, four over here. We need four protons on this side. Now we balance charge by adding electrons. You can't take them away. You can only add, and you just you just balance. You just you don't try to get both sides to zero. You just balance. So neutral, 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 positive four. So we need four electrons there to make them both zero, both sides zero. Here we've got positive four, and oh, it's so easy to forget that guy. We've got negative, sorry, positive 3 on this side, 
So we need three electrons on this side. I need a new screen, so let me go to the next screen. Now, just like with algebra, you need to do kind of like that simultaneous equations trick. You need to equalize the number of electrons on both sides. This one's got three. This one's got four. So multiply this equation by three and this equation by four. But don't forget to distribute that three over here. Now I write the whole thing down. It gets really ugly. 15 and 3 and 16 and 4 and 6 and 12 and 4 and 8. And then as we were talking about earlier with Chris, anytime you have anything that's the same on both sides, you cancel anything out. So we've got 12 electrons and 12 electrons, so they won't be there. Oops, I'm down here. Fifth, I think I started with protons. 12 protons and 16, so all of those go away and all but four here go away. 15 waters and 8 waters, so all of those go away and you're left with 7 here. Everything else looks good. We've got a prime number here, so we don't have to worry about dividing by a, a common multiple. And then just take the time to double check because this is never fail. This always works if you do it in this order. So check the mass. Here's the clean copy. 14 protons plus 4 is 18. 6 times 3 is 18. 6 arsenics, 6 arsenics, etc. Then check the charge. Four positives and four negatives is zero on this side, and these are both neutral. It never fails. It just takes time to, to do it. Bases are exactly the same as this process, except for adding protons. It's just a little weird. So bear with me. So when you get permanganate ion becoming this guy, we've already balanced the, um, uh, we already did steps one through, one through three, and it was just adding water. So here we had four oxygens, here we only had two, so we two added two waters. Here we had, oh no, here we only had aluminum, but we had four oxygens, so we added, oops. Yeah, no, I, yeah, oxygen, sorry. Now we balance hydrogen, and we do it by, remember we're not adding anything to the beaker, it's already there, we're just um, bookkeeping. We're going to count these hydrogens as this first hydrogen in water. So if we, need, if we have four hydrogens here, we need four over here. If we add them as four H's from the first H of water, we've just written down four OH's. So if we put that four OH on the other side, look at that, the charge appears. And that's what we need to balance is the charge. Because the electrons, everything else is the same. Let's do the same thing here. We've got eight and four. So we need four more H's there, but now we've just written down four more OH's, and if we put them over here, now we can balance the charge. In this case, it's the same. Yeah, negative one and negative one, negative four and negative four. So they end up canceling out anyway. So this one was maybe not the best example, but everything else works the same, and you end up with that. Yes? So basically all you're doing is instead of... Basically. <laughs> yeah. Is you're adding OH instead of um, well, you're H plus. you're accounting. You're well, you you first balance the hydrogen with the first hydrogen of water. Right. If you think of water as HOH, the first hydrogen is the balancing of that, and now you have to account for the fact that you've just written down four OHs. And remember, OH is negative, so that allows you to do the charge because the next step is balance electrons by adding electrons, balance the charge by adding electrons. So this one happened to be the same, but they're not all that easy, obviously. Elizabeth, you had a question. Would it work also to balance your basic equations if you did it in the acidic way and then converted the H pluses OH at the end, like added H OH on both sides? No, not always, but try it. Give it a shot. There's a whole bunch in the back of the book. Balance these equations in acidic media. Balance these equations in basic media. You just have to commit yourself to the method. It works every time. Woohoo! Time for practice or a quiz.